I chose this uh, uh, this particular chapter. We're going to also go to Kings also. We're going to talk about David. Not even just David. David had a friend that we don't hear about much by the name of Nathan. Nathan was a prophet. The reason why I like Nathan is because Nathan represents a friend that we all should have. A lot of us have friends that are yes men, people that will just agree with how we live, people that won't challenge us to be better, people that won't tell us what we're doing wrong, people that don't want to offend, we just want to kind of go along and get along. But Nathan was that guy that said, I'm going to tell you the truth no matter what. And I think as Christians, we need to be like that. Everybody in this room, we should be able to tell each other the truth, especially spiritually, and not get offended. You know, we have all become so comfortable in our feelings that when somebody violates that, that area of our, our comfort, which is our feelings, we get in our feelings. We, we get what well, we can't handle the truth. So we're going to talk about Nathan with these two um, chapters we're going to go. So we're going to start at chapter 12 in uh, 2 Samuel. Okay, so verse 1. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. This is a parable. Nathan, again, Nathan is being sent by God to tell David this. Remember, we talked about David with what he did with Bathsheba. There was a man named Uriah that was one of his head soldiers. He sent Uriah into battle with the Ammonites. The Ammonites were a, a tribe of giants. And uh, he sent Uriah on the front lines to have him killed because he fell in love with his wife, Bathsheba. So Nathan is about to confront him about this. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little lamb which he had brought and nourished up, and he grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. What this is talking about is Nathan's basically saying, Uriah had nothing. He was just a soldier for you. He had one wife. A ewe lamb is a, a, a female lamb. Ewe means female. So he said all he had was this precious little female lamb being his wife. And, you know, this is basically all he had. So we're going to keep reading and see how he's speaking this parable to him. And there came a traveler unto, him, and unto the rich man, and he spared to take up his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring no. that was coming to him, and to the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was coming to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing, Surely so you see what's happening here. He's basically, Nathan is telling David what this man did. David doesn't know that Nathan's talking about him. So he's saying, man, this man should be, this man should die for this. This is, why would he do something this cool? And Nathan said to David, thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. See, see, we know that King Saul was the king first. Everybody, they chose King Saul because he was the tallest man that they had seen at this time. He was, you know, good looking, tall, so they chose King Saul as the leader. However, Saul was not following the ways of God. Samuel kept telling him what to do. He got high and, and pride and started doing his own thing. So he got knocked off the throne, and that's when David came. Samuel sent Nathan, Samuel sent, um, God sent Samuel to go and find David. David became the king. Remember, we know about David, the story of David and Goliath. So he's saying, I, not only did I save you from Saul, but Saul wanted to kill David. After David, he realized David was going to become the king, he wanted to kill him. But God kept saving him from him. So he's saying, not only did I save you from Saul, I gave you everything. You had multiple women, you had everything you asked for. All you had to do was ask me what you wanted, and I would have gave it to you. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives, into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel, and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such 
things. We confirm and state what I just said. God is speaking through Nathan saying, I would have gave you anything you wanted. But you violated me. And not only that, you represent me. So you're making me look bad. See, we don't understand when we call ourselves Christians and we go out into the world and we do things that are contrary to this, we offend God. We make him look bad. So we should all think about that. How do we make God look when we go out of our homes or when we talk with our family? How do we represent God? Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the, the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Had him killed. Sent him out on the front lines from the die because you wanted his wife. Mm -hmm. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. I want to stop and talk about that verse mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. He just said, the sword <laughs> shall never depart from your house. So see, because of what he did with committing sexual sin, mm -hmm. taking another man's wife, mm -hmm. sexual sin is serious to the point of this. If you read more about David, he lost two sons. And not only that, we're going to keep reading and see what happens with their first child, which I already told you about, but he lost two sons. His son Absalom died because he wasn't following God. He actually tried to take some of David's wives. Mm -hmm. He actually was the one that tried to sleep with his sister, which was David's other child by another woman. Mm -hmm. So this is what happens. But, but, but what he says, by the sword shall not leave the house, that means death is going to reign on his kids. Because of this, what he did. <laughs> Serious. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will destroy the people against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. That's basically what I just confirmed about Absalom. Absalom was actually going after David's, uh, David's wives. For thou did it, did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. See, he's saying, yeah, you did this to where nobody really knew, but I'm going to punish you openly. See, we may do things in secret that we think only we see or that the people we're doing it to see or know, but when he punishes us, he does it openly. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. He's saying, I'm not going to take your life away, but I did say the sword would never leave your house. So I am, I'm still, what still stands is going to stand as far as what I'm going to do with your kids. Because you violated me, you knew about it, you made me look bad. I chose you to be the king, which means you had me flowing through you, but you let me down. How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. He just finds out that the child that he was born, that his wife that she was born with, is going to die. Mm -hmm. So we see how punishable sexual sin is. It would cause you to lose children. Mm -hmm. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore. He sought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Laid all night upon the earth. So he's at this point, he's in his house. He's realizing what he's done. Besought means to beg. So he's begging and pleading, communing with God, saying, Please, God, I know I messed up, but please don't take my child. But see, that's the thing. When we mess up, we don't have the ability to determine what our consequences are going to be. There's somebody else. God is in charge of the consequences. We're in charge of our own actions with the free will we have. But we don't know how God is going to choose to punish us. He punishes us severely when we act like we don't want him and we reject this word. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. He did not, neither did he eat bread with them. He didn't even want to eat. Because he knew his child was going to die and there was nothing he could do. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And David feared uh, to take his 
shall children that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, don't, don't. while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself? It will tell him don't, don't, that the child, don't, don't. if we tell him that the child is dead. But when David saw that his servant twisted, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So they just basically gave him the news. Mm -hmm. He knew because he's seen him whispering. Mm -hmm. And now he knows that his child that he had with the woman that he just grew to love is dead. Mm -hmm. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his pill and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. When he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. <laughs> then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child, while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. He basically came to the conclusion, there's nothing I can do. I prayed and I fasted because I didn't want my child to die. Mm -hmm. But now the child is gone, so it's no point. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me if the child may live? But now that he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David confronted Bathsheba, his wife. And went in, it went in unto her, and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord left him. So see, after he repented, so he didn't repent at first. Mm -hmm. So because he didn't repent, the, the punishment was even more severe. Mm -hmm. But once he repented and everything, they were able to actually have a child. Mm -hmm. Solomon's name actually means peaceable. Mm -hmm. So basically, spiritually, that's saying you now can be at peace because... Mm -hmm. I mean, I gave you a son by the name of Solomon, which Nathan named him uh, Jehadiah, mm -hmm. which basically means, I can't remember what it means, but mm -hmm. he, that name was ordained by the Lord mm -hmm. through Nathan. Mm -hmm. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jehadiah because of the Lord. Okay, so we'll stop right there. But basically, I wanted to read that because, see, Nathan, even though David was King David, Nathan still <laughs> respected him enough to tell him the truth. You know, we need people like Nathan in our lives because when we don't have people in our lives to tell us the truth, we, a lot of times we just carry on doing what we're doing. So we have to find people that will put challenge in us, that will force us to be what God is calling us to be. So let's go to uh, 1 Kings. We're going to start, turn over to Kings. It's actually the next chapter. <laughs> First Kings. Uh, we at chapter one. Chapter one. Mm -hmm. We're gonna read to verse. We're going to start at verse 1. Oh, start at verse two. Okay. I can read, Mom. Oh, okay. you? Um, so, 1 Kings chapter 1, mm -hmm. verse 1, start there. Yeah. Okay. Now, King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. David was so old at this point, his body couldn't even produce heat. So, they had to find someone that would come in to lay with him to produce heat. Wherefore, his servants said unto him, let there be saw from my lord the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout the throughout all the coasts of Israel, and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. Her name Abishag means king of Aaron. So 
See, I mean, it's funny, spiritually, these, these words and sometimes their names play a role in what they're doing and what's actually transpiring. So what's happening right here is he's laying up. Keep in mind, Bathsheba is his wife at this time. But they called this young girl in to lay with him to produce heat so he wouldn't freeze. Because, I mean, he was even covered up and he still couldn't get any, any heat to his body. Um, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself. Did I skip over? Yeah. Okay. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. He didn't even know this woman. They just found her and seen that she was young and, you know, decent looking. So they brought her in to lay with him. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king, and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Uh, uh, Adonijah is his, uh, at this point, this was um, David's oldest son. Because his other, his, his other sons had died. He will be said about the sword, not leaving his home because of the sexual sin he committed. So Adonijah is his son. He's trying to be king right now. Even though Nathan told David that uh, God told Nathan that Solomon will be the king, Adoniah thinks because he's the oldest, the oldest living son, that he should be king. So he's exalting himself without even going through his father because he feels like his father is old. So he can just exalt himself without permission, basically. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man. And his mother bare him after Absalom. So Adonijah, his big brother was Absalom, which was the one that did what he did as far as trying to get David's wives and doing what he did with his sister. So he's trying to basically be like him. Adonijah wasn't, he wasn't necessarily an evil son. He just felt like, because he was the oldest, he felt entitled to that role of being the next king. And he conferred with Jehob, or Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abathar the priest, and they following Adoniah helped him. These were people who were actually following David. So they just follow Adoniah without even asking, without even consulting with David. They just felt that because he was his son, he was the oldest, that it all makes sense to follow along with him. But Zadok the priest and Benaniah the son of of Joada and Nathan the prophet and Shammai and Rhea and the mighty man which belonged to David were not with Adoniah. So see, Adoniah, Adoniah basically uh, is starting a feast because he, um, he's thinking he's going to be king. So he's he's got all this, this big thing going on where he's gonna, it's going to be like a big parade and a big feast that everybody's going to eat at. But he didn't invite the people that he knew were real close to Samuel. I mean, real close to uh, David because he knew that they would have something to say about it. And Adoniah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is by Enrogel, and caught all his brethren the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. So it's going to be a huge feast. It's going to be a big, it's going to be a big deal because he's basically, again, he's anointed and put himself in this world. But Nathan the prophet and Benaniah, ooh, these names, and the mighty man, and Solomon, his brother, he called not. Benaniah was a, uh, he was a Levite. He was uh, David's, Basically, his uh, bodyguard. Remember, the Levites are the priests. They were the people who prayed and kept the temple right. So he knew these people. With Solomon and Ben and I, it wasn't going to be no sway in them because they knew what it was. So that's why he didn't invite them. We. Wherefore, Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adoniah the son of Haggith doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it, knoweth it not? See, there's David again. I mean, there's Nathan again, being the friend that he is. See, David loved Nathan so much that he actually named one of his kids after him. He named the son Nathan because you got to respect a friend like this that will always tell you the truth. Now, therefore, come... Let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and thy life of the son Solomon. Go and get thee unto King David and say unto him, Didst thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit up on my throne. 
Why then doth Adonijah reign? So basically saying he's Bathsheba is Solomon's mother. So he went to call on uh, Solomon. He knew David wasn't his right mind and he wasn't right health wise. So he, he Nathan went to call on Bathsheba to say, Look, we need to go talk to King David and see why just, uh, stop Adonijah from becoming king because he's exalted himself. We need to make sure that David. Uh, knows about this because he told us Solomon. Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. And Bathsheba went in unto the king into the chamber. And the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. So she basically translated. Bathsheba went in, and Abishag, because she was landing there with him, basically more closer to him than Bathsheba, she's basically translating what Bathsheba is saying. And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king, and the king said, What would thou thou? And she said unto him, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit up on my throne. And now behold, Adoniah reigneth, and now, my lord, the king, thou knowest it not. And he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the king, and Abathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. See, these were all people who were supposed to be listening to David, but they weren't. Even um, Joab, his captain, there were a couple instances where David had gave him specific instructions on what to do as far as battle, and he would do his own thing. So, again, these were perfect people to choose to, for, for Adonai to be on his side because they weren't as close as Ben and I and Solomon. And thou, my lord, O king, thy eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Basically saying, King David, we need you to tell us because Adonai is thinking he's going to do his own thing. It needs to, be, it needs to come from you who the king is going to be. Otherwise, it shall come to pass when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. Basically, uh, Bathsheba is saying, when they, let me see shall sleep with my father, basically mean when David go and he dies. Basically saying, otherwise, if you don't step in and tell us that Solomon needs to be the leader, Adonai is going to put us to death. He's going to have to. <laughs> and lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come, and before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. For he is gone down this day, and hath slain oxen, and fat cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has called all the king's sons and the captains of the host, and Abathar the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, and say, God, save King Adoniah. But me, even me, thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaniah the son of jo Joada, and thy servant Solomon hath he not called. Is this thing done by thy lord the king? And thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. See, Nathan steps in. He sees that he's, he's listening to Bathsheba, but he's not really, um, not really adhering to what she's saying. So Nathan, being the friend he is, says, let me step in and speak. You know. Then King David answered and said, call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all of distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit up on my throne and my steed, even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord King David live forever. And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Joada, and they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and call Solomon my son to ride up on my own mule, and bring him down to Jehon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there. Shh, come here. The king over Israel, and blow ye with the trumpet, and say, God save King Solomon. 
Then ye shall come up after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. So that's basically it. You see what happens. He told, made sure he told it to Bathsheba and to Nathan and to Zadok and ben and I, they all his close people knew what was going to happen. Even though we if you continue to read on, uh, Adonai actually tries to kill Solomon because he, you know, he wants that. He wants that role so bad, you know. But I just wanted to read those two um, chapters because I think um, we get so comfortable with those that agree with our lifestyles and agree with what we're doing that when anyone challenges challenges that or speaks something that goes against what we already think or believe or how we should live, then we get upset. And that shouldn't be the case, especially if it's the word of God that's being backed by what they're saying. A lot of times we look at who the messenger is instead of listening to the message. And that's a lot of times where we mess up that. I want to end on this scripture right here. Um, and also to cross-reference that what we just read, I know, I know it seemed like David kind of got a weird look at uh, with David now. But if you read, um, let's say it's Psalms 51. That was basically a whole chapter of him praying, apologizing. So, you know, we don't want to think that David wasn't righteous because he was. It was just, you know, he did some things wrong like we all do. So let's go to... Uh, Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 3. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 3 is on page 745. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princesses strong drink. Okay, okay yeah. So, uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 3 basically says, Give not our strength to women. I think that's a scripture that all men should know and read out loud to themselves, because a lot of us do give strength to women. Um, you know, we go to work and start flirting and doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. You know, a woman gives us a compliment, maybe about our cologne or how we dress. And we cross over and we start doing things that we shouldn't. And I think, like it says, it's a destroyer of kings. Giving your life over and giving power to women, sensual women. Some women, they just want to see if they can get you to fall. They're going to try to tempt you. They don't care if you're married. They don't care if you're in a relationship. They will try to tempt you just because they want that satisfaction of saying, man, I got him, he was married. Mm -hmm. Some women want that. That's, that's the Jezebel spirit in them that's doing that. But it says do not give place or give power to a woman. And I want to end on, we're going to end in uh, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. I love scriptures like this because they're short to the point they don't leave a lot of room for interpretation or confusion straight to the point Ecclesiastes 12 and 13 we'll end on that. that's going to be on page 755 oh. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13 on page 755. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man. There's nothing else on, the, on this earth that's more important 
than what that scripture says. And this is Solomon speaking right here. Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible. God gave him wisdom and understanding. He was a man of great understanding and wisdom. Ecclesiastes was Solomon in his end years. Like we just read about David, how he was basically old and stricken in years. This is the end for Solomon. So here we got this man of great understanding and wisdom, 700 wives, 300 concubines, comes to this conclusion. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Live it out to the end. Then it says, fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. He realizes through his life everything he did with all the women he messed with, how he had all of that money, he had all the gold. Even uh, He had so much, even Queen of, uh, Queen of Sheba had to come and see, like, who is this Solomon guy? But through all of that, he ends with that conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That should be the forefront of our life. Pressing into Jesus, speaking with him, communing with him. People should know Jesus because they know us. If people don't know Jesus because they don't know us, then we're as a man, even as women, we're failing if they don't know Jesus. We should always fit Jesus in there somehow. Yeah, we don't want to beat people over the head with it, but it says that is the whole duty of man. That's what we were sent here to do. Yeah, he called us here to, to multiply and replenish the earth because he wants to watch his creation. But we also have a book that we have to abide by. So we'll go ahead and end in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for a message today, a message of truth, Lord. We know that in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 32, it says the truth will set us free. We look for the truth, Lord. We desire, we yearn, and we long for more of the truth, Lord. And we look to find that truth in your book that you have written for us. We know sometimes that when people bring us the truth and people tell us about the error of our ways and what we're doing, sometimes we give them resistance. Sometimes we don't want to hear it. Sometimes we turn a deaf ear to it. Sometimes we may be at a church that is telling us the truth. And because it, it does not agree with how we already live, we'll leave that church. Or some of us become comfortable in the churches we're in because they don't challenge us to be better. Well, Lord, we desire more of you. A crease of faith, Lord. We ask that you purify our hearts. We ask that you put the truth in front of us, Lord, so we can continue to learn and adhere to that truth. We want to have the tongue of the learned. We want to have a deep understanding your word so we can disseminate it to others, but also so we can learn how to apply it to our lives. We give you the honor and glory and praise in everything that we do. We give you our hands, we give you our feet, we give you our mind, body, soul, and spirit, Lord. We submit ourselves completely and wholly to you, Lord. And we magnify your name above all things, and we thank you for saving and sanctifying us, filling us with the Holy Ghost, which is our discernment that we have to carry with us everywhere we go. And we ask that the discernment that you have given us, Lord, that we can go out into the world and preach the gospel honestly. We 